All right. So welcome everybody. Um, we're going to talk about that counter uh, in a little bit, but let me um, let me get in the presentation mode. And um, thank you everybody for coming out tonight. Yes, we should take a photo because this is the first time I've been in the room. But majority of females. Oh, I will. Very one. happy about that. <laughs> very happy about that. So, so um, my name is Jason Whedon, and I am one of several meetup organizers for the uh, Hashcraft meetup. And so, um, the other um, uh, organizers are just short of crying because they're they're not able to make it tonight. There are a lot of last minute um, stuff that popped up. That's the way it, it always is, but. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better venue. I mean, we're here in Harvard, we're hanging out, it was a beautiful day, and, um, and uh, I can tell we already have very enthusiastic people about this space, which I think is very interesting. So, so um, I did wanna give a shout out to the Harvard Law Entrepreneurship Project. Um, they are the ones that are sponsoring the meetup tonight. Um, that's why we're all able to come to this uh, beautiful building. And, um, and so uh, I'll start with probably the most boring thing, which is me, and then we'll just talk about crypto for the whole rest of the time. Um, so uh, again, my name is Jason Whedon. I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm an IT guy. So I've been in IT for a little over 20 years, I think. And uh, more recently, um, I'm in cybersecurity. So I work for a healthcare company. I do cybersecurity by day. And then I stay up late at night, um, much longer than I probably should, um, hanging out in forums, doing uh, doing all the crypto enthusiast stuff that all the other crypto enthusiasts here tend to do. So you're all crypto enthusiasts because if you're here on a night like tonight, you're enthusiastic about crypto. So you are you are you are a fellow crypto enthusiast. So um, so uh, tonight um, uh, we're going to talk about Hashgraph. And in order to talk about Hashgraph, what we're going to do in the journey is we're going to uh, set the stage for this thing called called consensus, right? And so, 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 so the way that I'm going to lay this out for you is is we are going to figure out what it is that consensus is, and then we're going to go through with different kinds of consensus. And then from there, what we're going to do is understand how Hashgraph relates to consensus. Because consensus is that term that is the foundational building block. Many of these exciting slides are like one or two or three words that I, that I put together. Not very impressive, but I did work really hard on a diagram that's like coming up. So, so you all have something to, to definitely look forward to. Um, so all the meat is, is uh, right here on my speaking notes. So that's why you'll see me refer to it. So, so let's talk about distributed consensus. And you can, call, um, uh, cons you, you can call this decentralized consensus if you want to, or distributed consensus. Distributed and decentralized can um, have uh, different, different meaning, meanings, but I'm going to use them kind of, kind of interchangeably here. And so. In order to understand Hashgraph, you have to understand consensus, right? So there are not really very good definitions of consensus out there. I kind of crafted one of my own um, and using a few different sources. And I ended up with a, with a few different bullets. But the way that I start this out is that it allows us to create a new class of applications. It's not a cryptocurrency on coin market cap. It is, it is not necessarily decentralized storage right away, but it's, 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 it's the building block, one of several building blocks, arguably the most foundational building block, upon which that we can build a new class of applications. So um, this new class of applications, it secures and formalizes digital relationships in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. And so, and so there's this social layer that consensus enables where, where it, um, it shifts the locus of power and control to the edge of the network. So, so um, uh, 
You may um, have looked at diagrams of social networks or technical networks where there's a hub and spoke design. So, so the idea here is that there's, there, there's no one hub. There's either no hubs or just many hubs, however you want to look at it from that perspective. And so, and so you have this, this, uh, this, this paradigm shift with consensus that moves, moves the power and control to the end such that it obviates the, the, the need to, um, to trust or rely on central authorities. Um, so, so in so doing, um, you're able to securely propagate updates. These are append-only updates to an otherwise immutable system of records. And, um, and, and what you end up with is an agreed upon auditable history of all the participants in that network, right? So, so the participants are all the, all the different nodes in, in the network. That's, that's kind of the, uh, the technical piece. And so, and so with the overlay, with the economic overlay of this concept of digital scarcity, which um, is exemplified by all the cryptocurrencies that you do see on CoinMarketCap, um, you have this, this social system that has this agreed upon system of record that's um, immutable except for the, the append-only updates that everybody has to agree on. So, um, so it's very exciting times. Um, we, are, we are, I think, uh, just at the very beginning of, of a shift that's really special. And for those of you that, um, that uh, are, are really looking at the space and learning about all, all, all the different um, nooks and crannies, you'll see things like decentralized storage, decentralized streaming, um, the ability to run some of the, the key infrastructure that, that was beholden to the, the uh, entities, the companies that were at the, uh, the center of it all with their data centers and having their economies of scale. And what you end up doing is going from the economies of scale to scale the economy back to, to uh, perhaps a reasonably sized um, computer that's in your basement. So, so I think that there, there's a lot of potential there. And so we agree that distributed consensus is um, a very important foundational layer. Um, we should take a quick tour of, of some of these consensus algorithms. And then, and then um, that is going to uh, dovetail directly into the hash graph consensus algorithm. Okay, so, so let's talk about um, the category called leader-based um, uh, consensus algorithm. So, these come in um, what are known as permissioned uh, DL DLTs, distributed layer technologies, or public ledgers as well. On the permission side, you may have heard of Hyperledger or R3. And so what they do is they have a leader. Okay, there's a, there's, there, there's a leader node. The leader may, may in fact change. But um, the responsibility of the leader is to put the transactions in order um, to, to help in uh, um, organizing the validation of that agreed upon system of record that, that we were talking about. And, um, and what's nice is that uh, they, they have a property called um, order or, or fairness. So um, put a pin in that, but that, that's, that's going to be one of the key things that we're going to talk about tonight. But fairness is this property that is not there in every consensus algorithm, but it allows one to be sure of transactions in the network are done in a particular order all the way down at the consensus pro protocol layer. So that would be important in things like auctions or games. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna come back to that. But um, there's, there's a few problems with these, with these leader-based networks. Um, one problem is that you have this vulnerability called um, a distributed denial of service. So, so I work in cybersecurity, 
And so uh, we look at these, these, these logs and these logs of, our, of, of the devices on the perimeter of our network. And you'll see that um, it's very easy for um, an entity that we'll call uh, a threat agent, you may know it as a hacker. They go to the website, they can, they can rent out this, this botnet, which, are, which is your horrible computer that you've never patched in, in your basement, and it's, it's a bunch of other computers that, that they've compromised. And they will, they will launch um, uh, their, their, their attack, their, their flood of, of network traffic on a target. So in leader-based, you have a target, you have a leader. And so, and so that's a problem. When you think about distributed consensus, you have to, you have to think about, well, what are, the, what are the properties that you give up when you're not centralized? Because if you don't think about those, you haven't solved correctly for the, the, uh, the optimized algorithm that you have for consensus. So when you're centralized, certainly there are some aspects of that that are more secure and some aspects that are less secure. But there's usually a very sophisticated way that one can deal with distributed denial of service. But in this scenario where the consensus algorithm has a leader, even if the leader can change, the distributed denial of service attack can do something called follow the leader. Because the leader is known in the consensus algorithm, so you just follow it and you, and you attack it. So you have this uh, single point of failure. Um, it could also be the case that who's ever managing the leader can be bribed in some way or otherwise be compromised by, um, by malicious software. So, so, uh, so you have this, this, this security hole in these, in these, in these leader-based approaches. You also have another disadvantage, which is performance. So when you're centralized, and um, let's say that you're a Facebook or a, or um, or an Amazon, and all your servers are in these are in these these, these data centers. Well, because you you constructed the network in such a way that you that you can uh, control it, you have um, very very high performance. Um, with these leader-based scenarios, they may be on the order of allowing for. Um, a uh, thousand transactions per second, maybe maybe in the network, the number of nodes maybe somewhere around a thousand. So you're not only able to uh, have this disadvantage of not being very fast, but you can't have that many nodes that are doing the validation, and so and so the security model is 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 a little bit different. So that's leader-based consensus algorithms. We're going to um, continue our tour with proof of work, which is probably the one that you're most familiar with. Um, proof of work is what's used by uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, IOTA. So proof of work is, is pretty good because it's, very, it's, pretty, it's pretty secure against distributed denial of service because of the way that the that the transaction validation is distributed in the network. It's really hard to find a target. So, 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 that's, so that's pretty good. Um, but the performance is not really that great. If you've done Bitcoin transactions re recently, um, even uh, Ethereum, so you know, I, I got an Ethereum wallet up and that thing can drive you completely crazy sometimes. So, so your performance can, can really be worse than, the, than those leader-based leader consensus algorithms. And, um, and you don't get fairness. So why, why, don't, why don't you get fairness? Why don't you get the ability to validate the order of transactions? Well, that's because the miner can decide whatever transactions they want to go into a block. And so, and so when the miners can decide what they want to go into a block, maybe it's going to be the one that's going to give them the most profit, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that means that you don't have the property of fairness. And so you lose um, this property, and therefore you lose the ability to have some classes of applications that become um, 
uh, really important in this in this uh, decentralized paradigm. So uh, we're going to talk more more about fairness, um, like I was saying later. Okay, so that brings us to um, economy based. This is kind of um, uh, a loose term. Uh, you may know it as um, a proof of stake, where where you have stakers, and so these are. These are various different kinds of algorithms that that um, that enforce the property of consensus, enforce security by making sure that something that you want is put on the line in such a way that um, that that makes it difficult for you to have any kind of incentive to screw things up, and so. So there's this, uh, what's known as this like game theoretical component to uh, these economy-based algorithms. And so, and so the problem there is that you don't have this mathematical certainty behind your consensus. You kind of have this assumption that everybody's going to be rational and they're all going to do the right thing to, to uh, maximize their stake, to protect their stake, to increase their profit. But you cannot make that assumption. Um, you can't make that assumption in a safe way because the staker could be irrational. Um, they, could, they, they could just be, they, they could have a malicious intent for some reason. Um, they could be taken over by some kind of malicious software. So if you've ever had um, uh, a, uh, a hacker take over your uh, computer. They can do with it whatever whatever they want, and so and so uh, the idea really is that you really want to have that mathematical certainty um, rather than the game theory for your consensus algorithm. That's not to say that there's not a place for it, but it it gives you pause for thought when you're when you're doing a comparison like this. So there's another class of algorithms that are not really talked about much. And um, this is going to be somewhat related to, to a hash graph. And hash graph's coming up, so thanks for bearing with me. So these pure voting algorithms have been around a long time. These are algorithms that have been around from, from since the 70s and 80s. And these algorithms are actually in use today in, in various other non-crypto uh, use cases. But um, it's very interesting what they do. So, so these, these algorithms say, hey, um, like all the census algorithms, we have to agree on the system of record. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my vote out there. So you broadcast your vote to all the nodes. And then all the nodes say, hey, yep, got your vote, cool. So you have this like uh, conversation back and forth uh, with all the nodes, broadcasting to all the other nodes. Everybody's uh, voting. You're sending out ballots. You're sending out receipts. And so what do you end up with? You end up with a very chatty um, uh, protocol. And uh, chatty uh, is a little bit of a pun because these are these are called gossip protocols. So so it's 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 that communication that you're sending out about your transaction, whatever it is related to your application, that uh, that is called gossip. And so they've been around for for a while, but but um, but they're not very efficient because of that because of that chattiness. It uses up a lot of bandwidth. So if you have nodes all over the world. Um, it's not. It's not really gonna gonna scale. Okay. When we're talking about consensus, we need to talk about security. We need to talk about the ability to scale. We need to talk about it being very very fast. Um, what's nice is that you do have the property of of fairness. So so once once they do all um, come together, um, you can uh, efficiently kind of organize. Uh, the the transactions in such a way where it's all it's all agreed upon. 
The first one to send the transaction over here, the second one to send it over here, everybody agrees on the order, in addition to the system of record in its totality. Okay, the other thing is that um, it has great security properties. So, so you're back to being able to show mathematically that you have finality on the system of record. Okay, that's called um, uh, Byzantine fault tolerance, BFT. You have that finality. So we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And you actually have um, the gold standard of security called um, asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerance, A ABFT. We're gonna come back to that too. So so don't worry about that. Um, but you you do so at a pretty pretty sizable price of 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 not having the performance be there, not having the scale to be there. And finally, um, for lack of a better term, I, I put combos up here. Um, that's not an official term by any sense of the word, but really what I'm, what I'm reminding myself to talk about here is that there's some newer protocols that kind of combine the aspects of these various different kinds. When you, when you combine um, some of these algorithms together, you basically inherit the problems of all of them. So it's not like you make any of them go go away. And so so it's with that it's with that basis talking about distributed consensus, what it is, what it should be, and these various consensus algorithms that we get to hashgraph. Okay? So so hashgraph is really a new category of consensus algorithms. And, um, and so it's supported by uh, a special data structure. So we're going to talk about how that, how that gets built up. But, but what, it, what it allows one to do is put these, these arbitrary transactions into consensus order. And, and, and it does so uh, such that um, you have this foundational layer for your globally distributed application. So it's putting these arbitrary transactions in consensus order to provide that foundational layer for globally distributed applications. If you go back to the beginning of the presentation where I talked about distributed consensus, the first thing that I said was it allows one to build a new class of applications. Maybe that's cryptocurrency, maybe that's cryptocurrency with something else um, to, to facilitate the new class of applications such as decentralized storage, for example, or uh, smart contracts. But, um, but you know, with, with, with Hashgraph, you get this ability to put these arbitrary transactions in consensus order in a way that's, that's fast, that's fair, and that's secure, OK? So let's break that down. So, so um, what I want to, to recap is that Hashgraph is a consensus algorithm. It is not a cryptocurrency. It is not a smart contract system. It's not any of the layers that one would build on top of a consensus algorithm. But it's the most foundational layer, arguably the most important layer, um, that uh, um, that can be used to build these new classes of decentralized applications. So it's at the bottom of the stack. And so the properties of high performance, high security, and fairness, it allows for that, for that better foundation. So, so applications um, uh, that would be built on top of Hashgraph would be things like anonymity, smart contracts, auction, and games. And um, you know, they, some of those require fairness, some of those don't. But to have that property of fairness is really key. To have that scaling is really key. Um, we've seen a lot, of, a lot of talk about scaling on the Ethereum side, where you have you know, a CryptoKitties uh, game that can, that can um, really, really slow things down. Bitcoin. Um, where just the pure amount of transactions are slowing down that, that, that consensus algorithm. 
And so, and so what you need is a, is a novel way to build up the consensus that gives you that performance and that does so in a way that's, that's secure and fair. So let's talk about how that's done. So with Hashgraph, what we are able to do is take those old voting algorithms where, where, um, where we are just sending out the transactions and the transactions flow, flow through the network. We're starting there because in any consensus algorithm, what do you have to send in any kind of scenario? Well, you have to send your transaction, which is the thing that's meaningful to your higher level application, whether it's a smart contract or a cryptocurrency or whatnot, digital signature, timestamp. Okay? So we're still sending all that out. But the novelty here is that we're adding just a little piece of extra data that allows consensus to happen in a way where when it comes time to have that Byzantine fault tolerance finality, we are able to do it and vote without sending out any votes. So we don't have that chattiness property of, um, of sending out the ballots, getting the receipts back, broadcasting that out, not having the bandwidth efficiency, and, 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 that's, and that's called virtual voting. So we're going to talk about gossip about gossip. That's what the GAG is there. And virtual voting. So, so um, gossip about gossip is that, is, that, uh, is that piece of metadata that is attached to your transaction that tells you about the flow of the transaction through the network. We're going we're gonna to dissect that. But because we're able to, to tack on a very small amount of data that shows the flow, we're able to allow all the nodes to assess the, the data that gets built up from all these transactions that are coming in, look at the metadata in, in, each, in each of those events and say, hey, um, I know what everybody else thinks is the is the source of truth and what that system of record is and i'm going to come to an agreement as to what that is by just looking at the stuff that i already have and i don't need to send out anything to let anybody know what what i think is the um the final system of record what i think is the source of truth I already have it. I just need to look at it and acknowledge it. And so uh, this is where the presentation gets pretty now. It's not like two or three words. So this is this is what I spent more of my time on. OK, so. So um, so this circle represents um, this this transaction that I'm talking about. But the transaction is put in this container called an event. So actually. In Hashgraph, the thing that gets sent around to all the nodes is not a transaction <coughs> technically. It's really called an event. Okay, so if you read through the white paper or you hear um, uh, uh, anyone on the forums talking about the event, that's that that's the whole kit and caboodle here. So you have the transactions, um, which are which are the largest part, and you have the the timestamp and the digital signature, which is what which is what one needs for any consensus algorithm. That timestamp it allows one to it, it allows a single node to say, hey, um, let me use that in determining this property of fairness within my algorithm. So so that timestamp allows um, the algorithm that's run locally to 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 determine the the uh, the timestamp. That everyone is going to be to be looking at uh, regarding um, when they think that that the event originator um, sent out the event, and by that one is able to do that 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 ordering and instill the property of fairness in the network. Now, this hash list um, is the gossip about gossip piece. So a hash 
is a way of taking a large amount of data and um and creating a a ah shorter string of data in such a way where where um one can only go one way from the validating of the data to the hash and not in and not in reverse so so it's kind of a way of obscuring and shortening the data and ah that's not super important but what's important is that is that we are taking this two pieces of data the uh the last event that 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 my node created and the last event that's passed to me remember if you're a node okay so I'll pretend that we're a node right we're all nodes we're constantly creating events because of whatever application we might be running um and we're, we're constantly receiving events from from other nodes it, it depends on the application depends on who is sending it to me and so if you attach that little piece of metadata uh that really describes the flow of the events through the network it's really very easy to come to consensus um in a way where you don't have to send any additional information out on the network so you have this property being bandwidth efficient bandwidth is is the size of your pipe that's connected to the larger internet and so because you're bandwidth efficient you have higher performance and so and so if you were to run um uh hash graph on your local computer you would have sub second latency you would you you would you would be able to run very very quickly if i have time at the end i'm going to show you a quick a uh, demo um that that i have um okay and uh, what i'm going to do is i'm going to fly through a few more slides and then i can i can um answer any questions and you can always go back to this one because this is a pretty diagram that i worked really hard on um and the only other thing i didn't really tie into is up at the top remember those events are linked that's that special data structure and that's what creates the hash graphs okay so so um the fancy uh abft property is what we're going to talk about next and so this um this property called abft is asynchronous byzantine fault tolerance so so if you remember the byzantine fault tolerance the bft is is um being able to sync with mathematical certainty so so every other node knows what every other node knows and everybody agrees on that and they agree that there's that there's no changes there now believe it or not um bitcoin and many other algorithms are partially byzantine fault tolerant pbft that means that the math and the cryptography work in such a way where you are increasing the mathematical probability of of certainty you 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 have this like kind of like proof of work finality but that is just like this increasing probabilistic certainty it's not real true certainty so to be byzantine fault tolerant you have that point in time where everybody agrees on the network so the white paper is actually pretty readable there's some math stuff in there you don't have to worry about that um i think the i think uh if you make your way through the white paper there'll be stuff that um you may not understand just like me but um i feel like it's very readable but one one thing that shines through is that you as a hash graph uh node participant um you have a probability of 1 that you are going to agree on the consensus of the network you are going to agree on the system of record in the network and that's very powerful to be asynchronous byzantine fault tolerant is very interesting and that's this is why it's so fun to study some of these other algorithms because they teach you about maybe some other um algorithms that are used in your favorite cryptocurrencies or decentralized applications so abft is very interesting okay it's very interesting because the 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 asynchronous piece talks about um what uh we in cybersecurity call an attack vector an attack vector is a is a way uh in which you can you can attack a network in a certain way at a certain time and so 
asynchronous BFT, the, the A part speaks to that. So there's this attack on consensus algorithms that states that if you do this attack on um, just over a third of the network, you can, you can systematically disrupt the network. Um, and, so, and so the gold standard of security is to be asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerant, which means that you, you're, you're um, otherwise um, impervious to that attack. So, so um, let me see if I can uh, if I can describe that a little bit better. So, so um, every consensus algorithm, including Hashgraph, has the the problem of if if one third of the network is kind of sectioned off and put to the side because there's a firewall or other kind of disruption, you kind of have this separation such that there's there's multiple parts of the network that are that are not able to talk to each other and and um, and reach consensus. So so even um, it, in these scenarios where where the network is slowed down or stopped for let's say two thirds of let's say for for one third of the network. It, any consensus algorithm is going to have a problem. Most other consensus algorithms are going to have a problem with even greater than one third being sectioned off, including Bitcoin. So like you hear a lot of times the 51% attack, but you can actually go you know, below 51% and launch this kind of attack and have a problem. It's not something that um, I'm fully versed at articulating perfectly. But what I can tell you is that it is a kind of attack where even if you assume that some messages get through, um, you're still systematically disrupting the network. If you're a synchronous Byzantine fault tolerant, you're able to uh, withstand that attack as long as it's not um, as long as it's not uh, a greater than one third of your network. If it's less than one third of your network, um, then, then it's, it's not a problem. So, so I'm gonna repeat back um, what I stated and I wanna make sure that I get that right. So, so um, if you were to take 20% of the nodes that and section them off in uh, Bitcoin and create a firewall around them because you're part of some nation that maybe has a firewall, that could be, that could be catastrophic. If your uh, hash graph system has 20% that um, is sectioned off, it would not be a problem. And so, so that's what the, what the asynchronous piece gets us. Um, and and um, and so so uh, what what we're left with is um, the the only assumptions that that we that we can say are safe is um, that less than a third are attackers and some messages eventually get transmitted over the internet. Okay, so let's talk about the current ecosystem of Hashgraph. So I said that it's a consensus technology. Um, it's proving itself actually in the enterprise arena, which is which is very interesting. So, so there is a lot of noise out there with white papers going on and scams and you know everybody thinks that this is the best algorithm or that's the best algorithm. But but what is interesting about um, this technology is that. Um, currently, it's under the auspices of a, of a company called Swirls, and um, and so so Swirls has this licensed um, uh, Java SDK. I'll sh I'll show you the link, and and that's also a product of theirs. And so so what they um, have done is they have proven the algorithm in 
in use cases that are applicable to companies, which is which is very which is very interesting. So, so so you have lots of companies that um, are happy to do a press release to say that um, they're on board with the with the Hashgraph pro product, and so. Um, uh, these enterprise use cases kind of span everything. Actually, my notes say that um, there's this credit union use case, and then my notes say uh, healthcare, supply chain, and financial sectors, but they haven't been made public yet. But over the last day or two, depending upon how closely you follow the news, um, with uh, Swirls, the company, and, and Hashgraph in particular, you'll know that Swirls has um, had some some announcements in the healthcare space. Um, there's uh, there's one scenario where um, there's this capitalized arm of over 6,000 credit unions uh, in this in this entity called CU Ledger, which is um, this this distributed ledger. It's 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 um, it's what's known as a permission ledger, and and it does things like ex exchange identity and it has messaging apps and even an application store for distributed apps. And so, so uh, they are building that entirely on on uh, Hashgraph for the uh, consensus algorithm. And so that's so that's very exciting. But the ecosystem right now is based on a permission ledger use cases uh, at the moment. Um, the other thing that's going on in the ecosystem is this is this timer thing that came out over the last day. So there's like this timer thing. And I don't have any information on what the timer is, but that looks like that there might be some kind of evolution in the ecosystem. I'm I, I'm assuming. But what I'll what I'll try to do is if I get um, any information from the team uh, um, that I can send out, I'll definitely do that. But there's this timer on Hashgraph.com that came out over the last day or so, and it says 19 days, 21 hours, 14 minutes. I haven't done the math yet, but Somebody was beforehand, and you think maybe it's in March thirteenth, right? So, so that so that's kind of that's kind of exciting. Um, so, are there any uh, questions before I show you a quick a quick demo? Yes. Could you talk a little bit more about the asynchronous part of the? Yeah, it's probably a good idea. It's the hardest. It's yeah, because it's it's the hardest thing for me to talk about in the in the in the presentation, because um, it's a very particular kind kind of attack, and I'm uh, admittedly still wrapping my head around the particulars of it. But the the way that it goes is, um, so so if if one were to um, play play games on the perimeter of a group of nodes in a network such that they could decide which transactions to let through and which ones not. You could, you could separate the network's logic in such a way where it would be difficult for everyone to come into consensus. It, there, would, there, would, there would be no way to have a way of having a complete communication line open and still have that system of record be transmitted in such a way where everybody agrees on it. So there's a, it's a way of attack that allows one to manipulate the agreed upon state such that it's not, it's not, it's not agreed upon. It's actually not agreed upon. Okay, I guess. So I'm a JavaScript developer, and yeah. asynchronous means something. It means something unique. different in Java. And, and JavaScript. So I'm I'm trying to connect that with the. the I don't think asynchronous. asynchronous. Yeah, I don't know that asynchronous is the perfect term for it, but the asynchronous piece has to has to do with the messaging that goes across the wire. So so it's not like um, in the tech terms asynchronous versus synchronous, where you know you're talking about UDP versus uh, TCP, or you're talking about, I just, um, in JavaScript, I, I, um, I send an event and I'm not like using resources to wait, to wait for something to uh, come back. 
it's not that asynchronous. So it's kind of, it, it's an overloaded term. I don't think it's like the best term to use for, for, this, for this particular situation. But what it has to do with is um, uh, if, if, uh, if in Hashgraph um, you are sectioning off um, less than one third of the network, and if I, I may have stated this backwards before, so it's good, it's good that you're asking about it. If you section off less than one third of the network in Hashgraph, um, the consensus algorithm will not, will, will not be affected. It will, it will not have a problem because the selectivity of the, uh, the gossip going out will, will be such that um, everyone will know what the state is and there won't be any disagreements about it. If in other consensus algorithms, you, um, you uh, do that for 20% of the network, it could be very disruptive. Could be very very disruptive. What percentage of the network would have to be in a hash graph to be disruptive? More than a third of the network, and that's the same for any consensus algorithm, as I understand it. Right? Well, yes. So, so what Hashgraph says is, hey, guess what? I have the gold standard of security. And I can withstand that attack as long as it's not greater than, as long as it's not affecting greater than a third of the validating nodes out there. Thank you for shaking your head and making me feel better <laughs> that I got the the one third versus the not one third right. But, but yeah, yeah. So so it's even more resilient. And so it's it, it's the gold standard of security when when we're talking about this distributed consensus uh, arena in which. Um, all of this is happening. Did I answer your question correctly then? Does that make sense? Yeah, it's, it's totally an overloaded term. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Um, yeah, so, so one of, if you can go back to the slide that has. The, the slide that is actually the interesting. It, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, let me do that. Um, so. I guess, what is the timestamp and why is the hash list not the timestamp? Yeah, so, so, so how, how do you know um, when um, a, a particular person um, made the stock bid before another particular person? Well, well, what you do is you put a timestamp on the event and you gossip it out and then, and then you're, you're kind of in the network understanding the flow by looking at the gossip about gossip piece, which is which is different, and what the algorithm does is is it looks at um, uh, what everybody that? thinks the timestamp is, and they take the median timestamp. They take the median. So oh, you're actually time. talking like clock time, like system. Clock time. Yes, yes, it's it's well, it's whatever the event originator put in that. But the, yeah, that. whatever the guy who's sending the thing says, yes. this is my clock time. I think it's, yes, I think it's the clock time, yes, yes. I think that's what the algorithm would do, is it would take the clock time and it would do that. And then, and then um, uh, I believe that timestamp is, is going to be looked at um, and changed as it propagates through the network. And then when it comes time to virtually vote for each node to say, okay, when was that, when was that event sent? It's going gonna, it's gonna to look at all the timestamps, and it's going to take the median, the one in the middle, not the average, the median. And that's what the timestamp is used. It's used by the algorithm locally on the node to determine, to determine the fairness property. It's not, it's not, it's, it's separate from, from, from the hashes, which kind of show, show the flow. Yeah, but like, isn't the flow the only true thing? Um, well. Right, like if I have a, if I, 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 I create a message, I, you know, I can pretend whatever time I want yes. when I create the message. Yes. The only true thing is that it came after this sort of accepted global sequence number and after yeah. the other ones I created previously. Yes. Right? So yes. Like, I, mean, I guess maybe you have more accuracy if you use the timestamp, that it's not as... 
Well, who controls the clock, right? Like that. Exactly. No, but no. I mean, everyone's running off their own clock. So. So the global clock is the sequence of events, right? The whole protocol is about a consensus on when did what was the order of things that happened. So the order is the time. Yeah, I'd have to go back to the white paper to see if it if it um if it compares like the timestamp in the in the other events versus the local the local time timestamp, but. Um, so I'd have to actually go back to what the algorithm says, but, but, um, but I know that, you know, the, the timestamp is going to differ by some amount as it's propagating through the network. And, and so, so in order for that to be compromised, let's, you would have to have, let's say, you know, 99, let's say that 99% are compromised and able to mess with the timestamp. Well, then that's going to throw your median off. But if like one or two are are outliers because they're malicious, then I think that um, that 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 gets um, taken as an outlier, and the median will solve that because you would have to the, the way that the fairness property works with the timestamp is it forces a lot of the network to be compromised in order to skew when the event arrives through through the system it's the best way i can describe it that's a good that's a really good question so it's, it's a really good question yes i wasn't quite clear when you touch based on the latency and bandwidth does it also apply to this yeah so latency is um for the benefit of the latency and bandwidth. yeah okay so so okay so um so the minimum that one has to send out in any consensus algorithm in these distributed consensus networks is the transactions, right? That's, that's stuff that's meaningful. The digital signature, which says, hey, I'm the person that sent out this transaction. So you kind of cryptographically va validate that. Um, and um, and uh, the timestamp, even Bitcoin has, has timestamps, right? Um, they may be used differently in different algorithms. So, so you have to have all those three. So is there a way to just send those out, but to have consensus on it? And so that's a really tough problem, actually. So there's, um, there's uh, this um, person or people or aliens that was called Satoshi Nakamoto that says, well, well, basically, um, I'm going to, you know, kind of slow down the network, do this proof of work thing, and and um, very very elaborate to make sure that that consensus happens. And then we 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 went through the other algorithms. But what if you could just send the transactions out and then just get just get consensus? Like that's that's ideal. Well, well, in in this case, you're just sending the transactions out. And you're just including a little tiny piece of extra information. That's what those two hashes are. That's that's the quote unquote gossip about gossip. And so because that's that's just such a small amount of extra data, you're optimizing your your bandwidth. You're not you're not losing a lot. You're number one for just sending that event out. You're not using a lot of extra space. And number two, you're not sending out extra messages across the wire to do the voting, um, to do the uh, um, receipt for the voting. You're, you're not doing that at all. So you're optimizing the amount of bandwidth that you have. And because you're doing that, you, you have uh, the ability to send out information and, and um, have um, uh, sub-second latency on permission networks. Um, and then it's probably gets out to seconds as um, or maybe tens of seconds as you as you scale out the network globally, but that's a huge many factor level of improvement over and above uh, a lot of these other algorithms that are out there now. Does, does that make sense? Okay, it's great. It's worse than a leader based system. What's that? It's worse than a leader based system. The leader based systems do not. So. All I have to do is send my message to the guy in charge, and he says okay instead of me telling everybody about it. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're not super performant either. Like they're not, they're not up to, you know, uh, um, thousands or tens of thousands 
transactions per second, at least that I've that I've seen. Maybe, I mean, it's there's there's a lot of diversity out there, right? So, I mean, what I've seen maybe isn't representative of everything that's out there, but. Even with the leader base, there's like different levels of validation. So you'll have like an elected pool and then there'll be other functions for other different kinds of validators that are not like super nodes, like Dash has like its super nodes. And then there's like these other nodes that do other things. And so eventually when you finally get to like, okay, let me get the consensus, it still takes a while because it's not just all necessarily just being sent to the leader. It's just that the leader has the most important role for the security of the network, but there's all this other stuff in the middle, right? And so, so they end up not, not really scaling very, very far. If you don't need to scale, because you have a small permission network, it might, it might not be a problem. But, um, but uh, hello. Hello, how's it going? So um, let me just show you a quick demo. Let's see if I can get my demo up, live demo. So um, <clears throat> the SDK is something that you can uh, download. And um, the SDK is, uh, that's called the Software Development Kit. So you, you fill out a form at swirls.com, um, you download it. And um, so what is what is that thing? That That is, uh, your 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 program that runs the consensus algorithm and that you can send transactions to you can build whatever little application you can send like um you know you can build a game on top of it or you could build something simple on top of it this is a game and um and uh um it, it also has these demos in it so it has like a, about four or five demos in it and so and so um, this is a little game where um, you can actually use the arrows on your on your uh, keyboard to um, try to get the little the little circle. But um, there's lots of other demos in there, and some of them are a little noisy, and um, I haven't really studied them enough to really show you them. But uh, granted, this is just on one uh, computer, but you can see the sub-second latency. Like, they're all pretty much moving in the same way. Um, there's there's, there's uh, artificially four nodes on, <laughs> on um, my uh, computer, and they're all coming to consensus about where the, where the position of the various different squares are and what the state of the game is. And so, you know, Hashgraph is all about, I have mathematical certainty that um, this is actually where all the squares are, and this is where the target is. And so um, it's able to do that uh, um, with uh, that Byzantine fault tolerant finality, and that's really what the what what that demo was showing. Kind of fun. Um, there's other ones in there that show you even even more. Um, they they have more uh, statistics. There's some statistics here, but um, the other ones have some some better statistics. So it's um, it's it, it's again Java. Uh, so you have to have job, job installed on, on your machine, which is not too difficult to do um, it's because that's a multi-platform program and, and then you can run the demos. And so any other, any other questions? Those are, those are good questions. I think some of the questions also stretch some of my own knowledge as well. It's always difficult to put yourself out there and talk about this stuff. Um, so, you know, I, I, I've been, you know, I've read through the white paper. I, I've talked with a lot of team members on the forums. Team is very bright people. Great. Um, Tom is on the team. Tom is a, Tom is a new member of the team helping out the, the, uh, legal side of things. So, um, don't ask him too many questions. He's so new, I think. Say, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Why does it require so many lawyers in one project? I'm confused. No, I don't think it requires a lot of lawyers. You said you have the you always have in house and then they have you and then they have one more guy, right? There's a general counsel and then I just joined and I'm you know, it's unclear if I'll be there a long time, but you know, it's a, they work with, you know, swirls the company, which is small in a startup and so growing very quickly. 